Hello and welcome to Nursing Emergencies. This is part of the Nursing Emergency Program and Respiratory. Now we're talking about pneumonia. Pneumonia, and particularly the type that we are concerned mostly with, is the hospital-acquired variety of pneumonia, where we have to be concerned about whether or not our patient is getting pneumonia as a result of our care. So this is an x-ray here, a chest x-ray. They usually don't come out too well when you try to put them into a slide and then into a video, but you probably can see that there's a lot more white down at the bottom parts of the lungs than there is at the top. This is the result of pneumonia. So we have some consolidation in the bottoms of the lungs there, and that is a patient with pneumonia. So first of all, we look for the risk factors that our patient could be developing pneumonia. And we're looking for this trending upward of both the temperature and the respiratory rate. Hand washing, of course, we want to have good hand washing, good mouth care, because these are some of the ways that our patient may be getting infected especially in the intensive care unit where our patients may be intubated, mechanically ventilated, we want to make sure that we have good mouth care. We have been able to identify the same bacterium or the same bug that is in the patient's mouth that ends up down in the patient's lungs as well. So that looks like a direct line of communication here. So we want to make sure we're providing good mouth care to our patient. Care of equipment. To make sure that our equipment is getting changed on a regular basis. Now this depends a lot upon your hospital policy. There are a couple different schools of thought. One school of thought is the more we change the equipment, the better off we are. The other school of thought is every time that we are breaking open circuits. So even if it's just unplugging that nebulizer at the bedside. Every time we are disconnecting circuits, we are opening up the system for bacteria to enter. So depending upon your hospital policy, you may find that we're not changing equipment as often as we did in the past or as often as you thought we probably should. Uh, one thing that is very effective, though, in helping to prevent pneumonia is elevating the head of the bed by 30 degrees. Although patients can have aspiration, and that is certainly one of the risk factors or one of the characteristics that can cause a patient to develop an aspiration pneumonia. We think it's these little micro aspirations that can occur in our patient that create pneumonia. So we think that the patient doesn't have just one big aspiration that is causing a pneumonia. If the patient has one big aspiration, that's called an aspiration pneumonitis. It's these small little aspirations, maybe just a little bit of stomach contents at a time, that could occur because the head of the bed is down and the patient is having some reflux coming back up and getting down into the lungs. So the early signs of pneumonia, as I mentioned just a moment ago, is this increase in respiratory rate that is associated with an increase in temperature or white blood cell count. Now what we're talking about here is we're talking about trends. I'm not talking about a respiratory rate that goes from 24 up to 40. We can all catch that. I mean, that's no big surprise. Oh, there's something wrong, right? Well, what if the respiratory rate went from 20 to 24? Yeah, big deal, right? Probably wouldn't pay any attention to that. And the temperature went from 37 to 37 too. Again, not going to pay any attention to that. But if we put those two things together and the respiratory rate goes up a little bit, the temperature goes up a little bit, hmm, that could be an early sign that your patient's developing pneumonia. Just something to tuck away in the back of your head, and the next time you do an assessment, just pay a little closer attention to what the bases in the back sound like. Because if you're starting to hear some changes in the breath sounds, it could be your patient is developing pneumonia. Now, you kick up your pulmonary interventions at that point, coughing, deep breathing, turning, positioning, all that kind of stuff, and chances are good you can mobilize some of that stuff and maybe get it out Keep it mobilized, and maybe the patient doesn't get infected. However, if we don't, and we allow this to continue to progress, what can happen is then the patient develops full-blown pneumonia.
So our prompt action for pneumonia is going to be our pulmonary hygiene, and this is a good preventative piece. It's also something we're going to do once the patient becomes infected. So the turning, the positioning, the coughing, the deep breathing, the forced exhalation, your uh, nebulizers, etc. All of those things are all part of our good pulmonary hygiene here. Antibiotics. In some hospitals, we're doing what's called antibiotic rotation where we take all of the antibiotics out of formulary every few months and then put another batch in formulary. And the reason for this is, the rationale is that if we take those antibiotics out of formulary for a while, less or fewer of our patients are going to develop an antibiotic resistance. So in that way, hopefully we'll be able to prevent some antibiotic resistance. Enteral feeding is really important. If we're not using the gut, then what can happen is we can get translocation of bacteria from the gut, it gets into the bloodstream, and then it can get over to the lung. So here's our comparison chart here, and it's comparing our different pulmonary emergencies to each other with the chest pain, the oxygen, the CO2, breath sounds, and signs of doom. So let's start at the top here and let's take a look at our pulmonary embolism. With a pulmonary embolism, the chest pain that we get is primary, primarily pleuritic in nature. And that means it's sharp, it's localized, and worse on inspiration. What we're seeing with our blood gas is a drop in our O2 and a drop in our CO2. Now remember that oxygen levels, our PO2 and our CO2, are going to tell us different things on the blood gas. The PO2 tells us about perfusion, the CO2 tells us about ventilation. In this case here, we have adequate ventilation, we just don't have very good perfusion. So what happens is that our O2 drops, the CO2 will also drop because the patient picks up their respiratory rate in an attempt to try to oxygenate better. Our breath sounds are nonspecific, Signs of doom are hypotension. ARDS is the second emergency. Chest pain, well, in many cases, there may be none. Same kind of blood gas situation, a drop in our O2, but in ARDS, we may still be able to perfuse CO2. Remember that CO2 diffuses across that alveolar capillary membrane about 20 times better than oxygen does. So at least in the initial stages of ARDS, we're going to see a drop in our CO2. CO2 is going to start to build up later in ARDS as that patient's respiratory function continues to decline. Our breath sounds, we have diffuse, rouse, crackles, whatever you're calling them at your institution. Refractory hypoxemia is our sign of doom. In pulmonary edema, again, no chest pain, we're going to have a drop in our, CO, in our O2 and an increase in our CO2. So this is more your typical respiratory-looking blood gas. We're retaining CO2, and at the same time, the oxygen is dropping. We have a problem in pulmonary edema with both perfusion and with ventilation. It's not a matter of getting the air in and out. The problem is getting the air to the alveolus because the alveolus is filled up with fluid in pulmonary edema. Breath sounds, we're going to have rowels or crackles starting in the bases, working their way up. Hypoxia is our sign of doom. Pneumothorax will have pleuritic chest pain, sharp localized worse on inspiration, and we would see that kind of atypical looking blood gas with a drop in the O2 and a drop in CO2, indicating that we still have good ventilation, we just don't have very good perfusion. Diminished breath sounds on the affected side or sign of doom is shock, indicating our patient is developing a tension, pneumothorax. Pneumonia, we have dull, diffuse pain in many cases. Sometimes the pain may be sharp, especially if the patient's had a very significant cough with this pneumonia. We again expect to see the O2 drop, the CO2 rise, because we're not getting good ventilation or perfusion at the alveolar level. Ronchi are the breath sounds we typically hear with pneumonia because we have bigger, thicker secretions that are in the larger airways. And hypoxia would be the sign of doom. So our respiratory quick check. You want to find out what's going on with your respiratory patient? Look for subjective dyspnea. Okay, remember subjective. The patient is telling you, I feel like I can't catch my breath. With an increase in respiratory rate. 
Now, again, I'm not talking about the change from 16 to 40. Everybody can catch that. What I'm talking about is 16 to 20, 16 to 24. Okay, in many cases, we may still see those numbers as being normal. But associated with subjective dyspnea should raise a red flag. This is an early sign. The patient will feel the difference before you see the difference. Lung sounds. Let's listen to those lungs. Listen in the bases in the back. That's where she is right now. Bases in the back. We're listening for rowels or crackles or whatever you're calling them. Ronchi. Ronchi are the, the bubblier type of sound that's in the larger airways and wheezing. Well, thank you for joining me for Nursing Emergencies Pneumonia. Let's keep going in the series and learn more about how to manage your nursing emergencies.